I want to talk to you today about the concept of commensurability. It sounds like a complicated concept, but it's used all the time in ethical reasoning and really in common sense reasoning. Sometimes we think it's pretty easy to compare certain options that we have. Other times they feel very difficult to compare. In fact, sometimes people will say that things are really incomparable or that they're not commensurable, incommensurable. And what kinds of things do people mean? Well, the common sense expression for this is, hey, it's apples and oranges. These are different kinds of considerations, and it's hard to judge how to compare one of these considerations against one of those considerations. And so sometimes we just mean comparisons are tough. But sometimes we mean something stronger, that we really don't know how to compare them. We can't compare them. And let's try to get clear about what that concept means. What does it mean to say that two things are comparable or that they're commensurable? What does it mean to say they're incomparable or incommensurable? Here's the kind of place where in the philosophical tradition this comes up. Immanuel Kant says that everything has a price or a dignity. Ordinary things, they have prices. They can be replaced. They cost a certain amount of money, let's say, or of labor, or of some other kind of good. And in any case, we can actually compare things by using that common medium of exchange. Those things have a price. But he says human beings do not have a price. We have a dignity. And that means there is simply no way to compare human lives to other kinds of goods. So suppose we're making a hard public policy decision where we say, let's say, oh, that some public health improvement could save a certain number of lives, but it's going to be quite expensive. Should we do it or not? Well, to decide, it looks like we have to put a price tag on a human life. And that's the kind of thing that Kant says we really cannot do. Human lives and financial considerations, he says, are simply incommensurable. Now, However you feel about that particular application, it's an important kind of issue. Often in public policy or in our personal lives, we have to consider various kinds of goods and make trade-offs among these kinds of goods. How do we do it? We look for some way of comparing them, but that's really difficult. And as soon as we think about comparing them, we start realizing, do we even know what we mean by comparing them? What does Kant mean by saying these things are really incomparable or incommensurable? Some things have prices, but other things like human beings have a dignity that can't be measured in terms of prices. I think there are three different concepts that go under the heading of comparability or commensurability. Now, it's a confusing landscape because some people, like Joseph Raz, for example, use comparability and commensurability interchangeably. And so if we do that, we really end up with one concept. But I think there are three that it's important to distinguish. So what are these three notions of comparability or commensurability? Logically speaking, the strongest notion of commensurability has been identified by Michael Stalker and Ruth Chang. They say that two things are commensurable if we can measure them on a common scale. It's a nice idea, and it makes intuitive sense. To say that two things are commensurable is to say that there is a measure that the two share that we can use for comparing those two things. And typically we mean a cardinal measurement. There is something like a scale, like that measure of heights on a wall for measuring a child's growth. That's the sort of thing that allows us to make comparisons of how tall you are this month as opposed to last month, for example, or how tall you are as compared to your sister, and so on. And so we can think about that notion of commensurability, and it seems very plausible. Two objects of valuation are commensurable if there is a common measure, if there is a common cardinal scale on which we can compare them. We can place each of them on that cardinal scale and then compare their values. So in an economic sense, for example, apples and oranges, though we talk about that as an example of incomparability or incommensurability, actually they're commensurable, they have prices. And you can go to the grocery store and see how much apples cost this week, how much oranges cost, and make comparisons. This many apples is equivalent to that many oranges, and so on. Now notice, the measure here is not generally unique. We can compare them in price, in dollars, in pesos, in pounds, in rubles, we can do all sorts of things. So we can measure on a sort of English 
unit scale, we can do it on a metric scale. We have a choice of the scale, but there is at least one scale, and typically if there's one, there are many possible scales that would allow us to make the comparison. Well, I describe that as the strongest notion of commensurability in the literature. There are two others that are logically entailed by it. They are weaker notions, and they themselves are logically independent. So we can't say one of those is stronger than the other, but they both follow from commensurability in that stalker chang sense. The first one is simplest. It simply says, well, these things obey a principle of trichotomy. What do I mean? Well, they're commensurable in the sense that one is above the other, or below the other, or they're at the same level. So in other words, either this one is worth more, or that one is worth more, or they're worth the same amount. That's a pretty simple way of saying that things are comparable. We can compare them. One's better than the other, or they're the same in valuation. And so that seems pretty basic. If something fails that, then it really does look as if they're incomparable. And so that's a notion, let's just call it comparability, to keep it distinct from that stronger notion of commensurability, and it simply says we can make the comparison. One goes above the other, or they're at the same level. Now notice that that does not entail that there is some common scale. It just says one is better than the other or they're comparable, but it doesn't tell us how much more that one has as value than this one. It doesn't tell us how much better that one is than that one. And so we miss this notion of how much, which is built into the notion of commensurability in the sense of having a common scale. I might know, for example, that this week apples cost more than oranges, but how much more? Ah, that is not supplied by that simple notion of trichotomy. We can make the comparison. I can tell you which one costs more, but I can't tell you how much more. Commensurability allows me to tell you how much more. How many apples for how many oranges? There's one more notion, and actually in the literature that talks about these things, it's really the earliest discussion and the earliest notion. It was developed by Hastings Rashtal. And the idea here is that Two things are comparable or commensurable if I, there is some quantity of the one that could be substituted for the other. So to go back to our apples and oranges case, I might not be able to tell you how many oranges compare to how many apples, but I can tell you there is some number of oranges that would equal that number of apples. And so this is roughly to say that these quantities, these objects of valuation, obey an Archimedean principle, which is to say a certain amount of one good can be regarded as a sufficient and satisfactory substitute for the other, however much greater be the intrinsic superiority of the latter. Now that is independent of the principle of trichotomy, but it is entailed by the existence of a common cardinal measure. So the idea is roughly this. I may not be able to tell you exactly how much it would take to make this comparable to that, to make this equal in valuation to this, but I can tell you there is such an amount. Now you might think that's actually intermediate in strength, that it's not just saying, hey, I can tell you which one costs more this week, but I can say, well, ooh, I can't tell you how much more it costs, so I don't have full commensurability. But actually, I can't even be sure that I can tell you which one costs more. I can just say, given a certain number of apples, there is some number of oranges that would be equal in value. But I don't know what that is, and I don't even know whether that means more oranges or fewer oranges than apples. And so I get less information, you might think, than that principle of trichotomy. But there's another sense in which I get more information. Because, for example, the principle of trichotomy might be satisfied if I say, this one's better, and in fact, it is just incomparably better. It is infinitely better. As Kant might think, for example, if you compare human lives to actually quantities of money, you could think, hey, look, if, if I have to make such a comparison, a human life is just worth more than any amount of money. Now, I'm not sure that's true, but suppose it's true. Then we would know that a human life is worth more, but we wouldn't know. In fact, it would not be the case that there is some amount of money that actually could compare to a human life. That's the kind of thing that emerges in John Stuart Mill's discussion when he's talking about qualities of pleasure. Are they comparable in the sense of 
satisfying that Archimedean principle. So that for any kind of pleasure here, there is some quantity of this kind of pleasure that would be comparable to it, or of, I should say, really, that would be of equal value to it. Mill's discussion is unclear. Basically, he says, well, I, I'm not saying that there is this kind of large gap, infinite gap, if you will, between different kinds, but he also says that there could be. I mean, it might be that people would decide, I wouldn't trade any amount of money for that human life. Maybe they decide, I wouldn't trade any amount of purely physical pleasures in exchange for this more intellectual or spiritual pleasure. And if that's true, then we would be saying it does not satisfy this Archimedean principle. It is not the case that things are commensurable or comparable in that sense, even though they do satisfy trichotomy. And I could tell you, yeah, this pleasure is better, but maybe it's infinitely better. So those three notions, the notion of having a common scale, which is the strongest, and then satisfying the trichotomy principle, I can tell you which is more or whether they're of equal value, or this other one, I can say, well, at least I know that given some quantity of the one, there is some quantity of the other that would be equal in value to it. Those are different notions of commensurability or comparability. So if I say, hey, these things are really incommensurable, what do I mean? Well, it might mean I can't compare them at all. I don't know which is better or whether they're equal. It might mean that, hey, it might be that one is just infinitely more valuable than the other, or it might mean there is no common scale on which I can measure them. Those are different notions. So before you start using terminology like this, these things are commensurable or comparable, or incommensurable or incomparable, try to be clear what exactly you're saying.